Hey guys, we're we're back talking about the second arc of Shira. I'm David. I'm Sophia. I'm the one that talks a lot, but says nothing at the same time. <laughs> I'm GC13, the attempted voice of reason. I remember when season one was coming out and the creators started talking about it on Twitter and talking about the writing process. And they were in the process of writing season five and the finale when season one came out two years ago. So they were basically wrapping up the show when it first started airing. So they weren't done. Like, they didn't have a finished show, but they were basically done. Which, the announcement for the show only came out a year before the first season came out. So a ton of work went into basically producing an entire series before it was really validated that people were going to enjoy it, which is, I guess, something different for the Netflix animation age. Yeah, Netflix, I was really scared for the show because Netflix has not been kind to its shows. It's been giving them the axe after three seasons. No, rip forever 12. Yeah, randomly and with no warning. So I was really worried she would not get, you know, a valid and complete ending. But as it turns out, they, they did and they got a ton of work done in a very short amount of time. Do you think that season three was written in such a way as that could have been the ending if they wanted it to be? Like, if they had to have season three be the ending? I mean, they left, and you'd be like, oh, there's aliens, and there's a bigger horde, <laughs> you know, waiting around. You know, they successfully prevented the planet from being returned back to the greater universe. That's that's how Steven Universe could have ended, though. That's how they planned that Lapis episode, as they said that could have been the end of the series, and you would have just been left with, oh, the gems are aliens, and there's a whole world of maybe scary gems out there. Yeah, I only bring it up because the end of season three gives us a very big victory moment, where you can kind of imagine that as a riding off into the sunset if you don't get another season pickup after that. Min m well, minus the the heartbreaking sacrifice of Queen Angela. Yeah, I mean, it was that, well, it wasn't for waste, you know. Her sacrifice was to close the portal and keep the planet from crumbling out of reality. Yeah. Thank you, Kesra, by the way. I'm really sad to lose that voice actor, though. I'm really holding out that yeah. they come back. Yeah, I loved Angela's character so much. It's, and I loved how she had this, like, pompous British accent and then her daughter did not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of weird, but it, it fits her character. Her husband never had that accent either. I love royal accents in media like this, <laughs> where they don't really actually fit into any narrative. This is the same thing in Breath of the Wild, where Zelda had, yeah. in the American version, that, like, just ambiguously royal accent and, and then no one else did. It's like if you ask somebody to be like, okay, what do British people, British royals sound like? <laughs> and that's the accent that they would give you. Yeah. Regardless of how accurate it is. So this arc is really focused on, I guess, relationship building. I feel like that's one of the biggest themes. The Hordak and Entraptor relationship was probably the boldest, most interesting thing to happen just because anything with villains and neutral characters there's a lot of interesting ground there, and I think this broke that. But obviously there was a, a lot going on between everyone else in our core cast, too. Catra's complete spiral into total villainhood, oh, especially yeah. in, in the Crimson Waste. Yeah, this was, the, this was the moment that made me just kind of give up on the writers ever redeeming Catra. Now, now of course, that means they're going to now, now that they've made <laughs> me give up. But when she's like, the way I break down her logic is is like this. Okay, I'm very annoyed that Adora always gets what she wants. Adora does not want the planet to be destroyed, so I must destroy the planet. And they're like, okay, Catra, I'm done with you. You're dismissed. Noelle actually just put out this really interesting tweet, even today, I think, where she said that both Adora and Catra both think that they do the wrong thing all the time but they both have completely different reactions to that. This season definitely focuses on Adora feeling like she's not doing the right thing. And similarly, Katra is experiencing that as well, but she can't handle it at all and just decides to continually uh, double down on it. And it was really heartbreaking because this season also developed Scorpia's constant flirting and their relationship got so close and then you know, Catra put the Horde and her obsession with, you know, what what even is it? Just proving herself, I guess? Yeah, validation, essentially. Right? So she wanted somebody in the 40 
to say that they were proud of her, to say that they valued her, right? Like, she needed that more than anything else, and she would go to any lengths to achieve that, which resulted in everybody who was ever close to her being driven away, which kind of leads to season four. But in season three, we really see the kind of Catra's character unraveling and why she's not just evil for being the sake of it. She really wants to be worth something more than anything else and will not accept validation from the people who matter, only people from positions of authority, which, you know, aka Hordak. You know, she keeps on thinking that she knows what she wants, you know, and, and, and it was, it's the same thing with Zuko's arc. Like, what he actually needed and what he actually wanted were two completely different things. He wanted to be restored back in the Fire Nation, to be validated by his father, to restore his honor, na 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 and he got that, and it was only because he got what he thought that he wanted that he realized that it wasn't what he needed. And, you know, resulting in his whole really complex redemption. And we're kind of seeing the same thing with Catra, which I'm really intrigued by. Yeah, and meanwhile, that's paralleled by season three introduces the fact that Hordak is basically dealing with the same problem. <laughs> and his whole thing is just to impress his 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 dad, his... his. He calls him brother. Yeah, sort of like his big brother. But it's the same sort of relationship. Although I guess he, he wasn't really raised by Horde Prime. There's kind of an absence of the the torture that, you know, the the mental torture that Shadow Weaver put on Catra. Yeah, but he was like in the same way that gems are created for a purpose and kind of, you know, needs... And it's also very similar to the gems, actually, in Steven Universe. They're created for a certain purpose and they experience a lot of um, dissonance and dysphoria when they're not fulfilling their purpose. And Hordak's experiencing basically the exact same thing. He was cloned for a certain purpose, he was defective, you know, like he didn't want to die, you know, he didn't want to be purged off, so he wanted to prove that despite his defectiveness, he could be useful to Hordak, and in that process, developed an identity. So this show, right, comes from he and there's all these really goofy characters, and I feel like that Hordak fits in that realm. But they did they accidentally make Hordak sort of hot? <laughs> once he, uh, like, I don't know if it's once his vulnerability is revealed, but, like, his hair somehow becomes bluer. And I just... Oh, he, he gets the emo hair. Yeah, why do I feel both so sad for this character and also, why is his hair so good? Don't be intimidated, David. Just try to imagine him in his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I am okay. definitely going to spend the time to take the squillium body hate, and put that on the I hate that you said this uh, <laughs> to me because my whole take on this is completely different. So I was completely floored by the direction that they were going to take Hordak in his story. I thought he was just going to be this like emotionless, tactile leader who, you know, just is just evil all the way or whatever. And then they made him into this like weird goofball um, who's like kind of awkward. And I was I was so floored by the direction that they're going with Entrapta and like them being romantic question mark question mark. And at first I was like, what what is going on here? <laughs> and you know what, Entrapta, I support you. I support you and your ugly ass boyfriend. Like as long as you're happy <laughs> and he treats you well, whatever. I, I loved the Hordak and Trapter relationship because it's like, this is as boyfriend and girlfriend as She-Ra gets. And I'm counting those chicks from the finale of season one, the ones Bo had no idea what they do there and who we didn't see again <laughs> until season four. And I'm counting Bo's dads. A weird union was weird for me. I, I don't, this story is so weird because it feels so traditional in that it's a story that, you know, Bo's trying to tell his family something that he's kept secret for a long time and it's like told in essentially like coded language it's weird because they position that with his gay dads and i don't know why yeah like, what it that was, is it, it was, was very kind of interesting a, a bizarre metaphor for queerness you know coming out as gay or trans because a lot of people have been saying Bo seems to be coded as pretty trans and this whole episode could have been like a metaphor for him coming out as trans but he already would have been come out and already would have been accepted by his dads and so the dad the gay dads accept being gay accept being trans but draw the line at being a soldier 
I'm just thinking back to Reunion, where it's like, okay, we're undercover, 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 then all of a sudden, oh, hey, big bad guy breaks out, and then, it's like, okay, how are we gonna deal with this? And then the door is going for the sword. Oh, don't worry, this will be a piece of cake. <laughs> and it's like, she completely, for it's like, not even any, okay, I have to do this, or else something bad will happen. It, it's just like she forgot what they were doing. She's a terrible liar. This is a well-established character trait. She is a terrible liar. And I, and I love their their um, dedication to have her pronounce everything incorrectly the whole episode. And put the emphasis on the wrong thing. For the honor of Grace Skull. For the honor of Grace Skull! Grace Skull! Yeah, and then she just kept on adding majors. Like, instead of just being like, oh no, no, Bo was mistaken. I changed majors. <laughs> right? No, she can't lie. So she No, just she kept asking in. if that was even a thing she could do. She's like, also, I taught? Can you do that? Can students do that? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's what you spend your entire graduate year doing, is being a TA. I'll tell you, they're young, they're goofy. The conclusion of Roll With It is just brilliant, because they're doing all these plans, and then it's like, okay, none, none of these subtle plans work. Let's just go in and use this absolute brute force for which they have no possible counter. Let's just do that. Yeah, Scorpia just freaking out was so great. Like, they just believe the way they were overhearing their plans, too, through that little robot. <laughs> and they just believe, like, everything is this serious threat. And then they do those things. And then Kyle messes everything up. And I love the little, like, serious bit they included in there of Adora with, like, trauma, being like, you guys are not taking this seriously. You know, she's using this game as, like, a coping mechanism to try and, like, put logic and plans into everything so nothing can go wrong. You know, and how she's truly scared of Katra, and how she feels so vulnerable by having all these friends because she knows Katra will take advantage of it. And that kind of, like, really dark, serious tone that we saw. Well, and it was supported by the jokes because everybody had their own interpretation of Catra, which was extremely <laughs> hilarious, but also very much not how Adora felt about Catra. <laughs> yeah, Adora's like, no, she's gonna, you know, slit all your throats and make me watch. So maybe take this seriously. And they were all like, we're the most powerful people on the planet. Let's just bull rush it. And it worked out, so. <laughs> yeah. There's a ton of development in this arc with yeah. Shadow Weaver, who gets the whole light spinner um, yes. backstory filled in. But man, if <laughs> if this isn't the most complicated, uh, motivated character in this show. I mean, in some part, it becomes really simplistic because it just becomes ultimate power. But, but in some sense, it's never really about the power, but it's really hard to break apart exactly what Shadow Weaver wants, even after seeing her entire backstory. Yeah, after all of that, I still don't understand... Like, when she went and pledged to Hordak at the very beginning, was she trying to infiltrate him? Or was she genuinely just, this guy will give me power, and I've just done a power-hungry ritual that's messed with my mind? Like, we don't know. I think it's the latter. Maybe, like, later on she was thinking about how she could take advantage of it. I, I do like that Shadow Weaver was able to somehow, um, probably through scrying magic, able to discern Hordak's true plan. I think, no, I think Hordak told her. Well, she said that Hordak didn't, though. Yeah. Like, Catra taunted that to her. No, I think Hordak knew, told her a little bit, and she maybe did a little bit of spying. Or read his diary. <laughs> yeah, read his diary. <laughs> well, he is emo now, so maybe he was keeping a diary at that point. <laughs> it's a journal, gun. Mom, it's not a diary. <laughs> there is one more insecure character out there who had a fantastic moment in an episode that heavily featured my girl Entrapta. Oh, I love Seahawk. I'm cool, right? Oh yes. my god, oh my Seahawk's gosh. Seahawk and Scorpius bonding. And drunk Adora <laughs> telling them that they're her best friends. <laughs> and they and they buy into it, or they're like, you know, they're mostly dismissing her, but when she does that, they like look genuinely touched. Yeah, the, the characters <laughs> with the least amount of brain cells to share between them are now all suddenly together. And I like how even though they're they're teenagers that are supposed to be acting like adults like they're still goofy kids who are doing their own growing up at the same time like it's not like you suddenly turn 16 and you're adult like you're still goofy and want to have fun and mess around and all that it's not like you turned 36 and you're still magically an adult 
Well, I mean, Entrafta <laughs> is supposedly in her 30s. The show yeah, did some, confirm somehow. that, Love which it. I think is Love so... It. I would say, like, when you're a 30-something, you're like a bona fide adult. Right? Which is so funny. Who enjoys tiny snacks. I, I just love that Entrapta has been spending literal decades being a weirdo in her uh, castle, just building robots and such. And is totally fine, like, kicking it with both teenagers and, like, immortal fascist dictators, but... I mean, everyone thinks she's a weirdo, so it's like she, she doesn't fit in anywhere. That means she fits in everywhere. Yeah, that one tweet where it's like, everyone is vastly underestimating... Entrapta's age, and it's like maybe to show Entrapta's age, we can show her doing taxes. But it's like, who am I kidding? Entrapta would never do taxes. <laughs> She's the princess. They pay taxes to her. This is a good point. Hmm. Tiny taxes. I mean, how do you how do you think she affords all those robots? I'm telling you, it, it's not from working down at the convenience store. Yeah, every every part, every animated bit of Entrapta on screen is of her avoiding taxes. <laughs> evading taxes <laughs> i mean if you are not doing taxes you are by definition evading taxes so <laughs> she and yoshi could hang out you know <laughs> i think catcher is the one who really nails uh, avoiding taxes the most because uh in the conclusion <laughs> season three in the portal uh remember in the portal well catcher activates the portal and it definitely erased taxes and everything else and man that was a trippy two episodes just a conceptually like outstanding set of television yeah these like perfect realities that like everybody you do is experiencing at the same time like there were these two realities where one there was no horde and that micah didn't die and then the other one was the horde was winning right and it all kind of centered around adora a little bit like it was like like a video game where where the characters don't do anything unless you're there the one where there was no Horde happened after the Horde had already been erased. So they had been erased from history, and she was witnessing what the world would be like without the Horde. Bo is still a historian, Micah is still alive. Yeah, somehow yeah. as the world was consumed by the portal, then the world was built around that version of it. Yeah, like constantly changing and all that. And like Adora could still remember the things that were being deleted, but it took... Well, everyone could once they really thought about it. And then we saw Micah, and now that we know that every character that experienced this alternate reality remembered it, and sometimes had difficulty discerning what was real and what was not. So Micah was pulled from Beast Island and into this fantasy, seemingly out of nowhere. And then Angela's like talking about, you know, how she misses him and how he's dead. And then he says, Angela, I'm not. And then it cuts out. And, you know, we had the gap between seasons, and everyone was like, he's saying he's not dead, Mike has been alive this whole time, what a twist! And I'm like, Psh, that's not true. <laughs> and I was proven wrong. Um, he was saying, I'm not dead. Because he was, he was just kicking it like a feral little animal in <laughs> Beast Island. As far as Adora's and Catra's sort of how this arc wraps up their relationship, the fact that Adora finally ends up kind of rejecting Catra's ability to, to be redeemed and just punches her in the face. Yeah, it gave up on her. And then at the end, you see her just ice cold glare at Catra and Catra kind of realizing like, I can't take advantage of Adora's love for me anymore, right? Like I've taken it too far. Yeah, like Adora's pretty much right to do that almost. Catra has pretty much firmly shown that she could not be a good friend and yeah. had been called out on everyone. Friends don't destroy planets while their friends are on them. Yeah, and, and how she says in the in the alternate reality, I'm not leaving you behind again, right? How she still regrets what happened, even though yeah. she wasn't at fault, really. You know, how she still wishes it could be different and how she, you know, carries Catra to safety and, and still clearly very much loves her and was punished by Catra for that so much she's like you know what it's not it's not worth it anymore like and, and that's good it's good because Catra is realizing that she can't do this to people anymore well season three is the season that ended Catra for me uh, season four didn't bring me back um, but we'll be talking about season four later and then when season five comes out we'll be there for that until the end though I'm GC13 I'm Sophia. And I'm David. If you guys like the content that we're producing, please give us a like and a subscribe. 
and leave us a comment. Um, we are very open to suggestions that you guys might have on what stuff we should discuss in the future. Let me know when you gave up on Catra. <laughs> I, I, I'm still holding out for Catra. I'm Sophia. I shouldn't have said that while I was stretching. <laughs> I'm Sophia. Shadow Weaver, get out of my laboratory! <laughs>